Hey everyone, in this video I will be breaking down volume 6 of 100 Bullets. This volume is composed of six individual one-shot issues, each focusing on a different character, and I think all of the issues have their own unique charms and are quite fun. So let's dive into it now. 100 Bullets, volume 6. 100 Bullets, Volume 6, Six Feet Under the Gun, written by Brian Azzarello, art by Eduardo Riso. 100 Bullets, Issue 37, On Accidental Purpose. In a bar, Mr. Shepard and Agent Graves meet. They shake hands, they get some drinks, and they talk. Graves expected Dizzy to be here. It seems like Shepard was in charge of trading her, and then, when he was done, he was supposed to then pass her on to Graves. Graves asks, Shepard, why isn't she here? Shepard simply answers, she wanted to go home, so I put her in a cab. Elsewhere, we see Dizzy leaving that cab. She is back home in Chicago. This is her first time being back home since issue 3 the first story arc where she killed her brother and fled with Mr. Shepard. As she is walking around the old neighborhood, she runs into one of her friends named Kimmy and her son Orlando. Kimmy and Dizzy hug, and then they go into a nearby laundromat, where another of Dizzy's old friends is named Droopy. Dizzy says hello to her as well as all of their kids. Droopy and Kimmy tell Dizzy how much they missed her. And after the pleasantries, they ask, So, what have you been doing? Who have you been with? They tease Dizzy, saying, Don't you come around after being away for more than a year, dressed all fine, and tell me no man's behind it. So what's he like? Dizzy, being a little bit evasive, answers, Well, he's older. Dizzy is referring to Shepard, as she's kind of been on this adventure with him for the last several months back over to the bar where Shepard and Graves are talking. Shepard tells Graves she's too young. Graves replies, Pity age is nothing to do with experience. Graves can tell that Shepard is fond of Dizzy. He asks him, Have the two of you, um, you know. Shepard explains, Nothing like that, nothing romantic, but I got feelings. And I don't want to see her. Graves jumps in, Dead? Shepard answers, no, I don't want to see her like us. Graves replies, I understand, but Shepard, you and I, we aren't like anyone else, and neither is she. Shepard cuts in, saying, exactly, she deserves to be better than we are. Graves replies, and she may be, eventually. She's young, and she may outlive us. Shepard quips, so she'll inherit your perfect world. Graves to this says, Nothing has, is, or ever will be perfect. Back over to Dizzy, talking to her two friends, Kimmy and Droopy. Kimmy and Droopy are explaining how hard their life is to get by and make ends meet. Lots of kids, minimum wage jobs, some of them work in two jobs. One of the girls there says that she recently moved into a new house, although it's pretty cramped because they're living with her husband's father as well as her husband's sisters and their husbands too, plus seven kids. Even though it's very cramped, the girl says, at the end of the day, it's family, and when you lay down, family's all you got. This seems to hit Dizzy. She remembers her brother as well as her mother. Eventually, Dizzy tells the girls, it was good catching up with you, but I got my own writing needs doing. Before Dizzy heads off, her girlfriends ask, But you ain't told us about that man of yours. What's his business like? Dizzy answers, I'm not really sure. And she heads off. The girls comment to themselves after Dizzy's gone, Well, that can't be good. Afterwards, Dizzy travels to her mom, Bonita Cordova's house. She knocks on the door, but a strange man opens it. Dizzy explains she's looking for her mom, and the man tells her, that this place here has been empty for six months. He goes and grabs some old mail of her mom's though and gives it to Dizzy. The man explains to Dizzy, I checked with the landlord and she didn't leave no forwarding address. I hung on to any mail that showed up. It's against the law to throw it away, you know. Dizzy, a little sad that her mom's not here and she has no way of knowing where she is, asks, 
What the hell am I supposed to do with this? Back over to Graves and Shepard in the bar. Shepard tells Graves she's not ready. Graves replies, well then make her ready. That is your job, right? Shepard answers, more of a sideline. My business is keeping tabs on you. Graves, he responds, true enough. And how is your employer? Shepard answers, Graves, Augustus is busy consolidating his power. Most of the families have fallen in line and those that haven't will soon. And that hit on Daniel Perez? Well, that just helped Augustus. Graves says, amongst other things, it was meant to. You see, Shepard, I want Augustus's little scheme to work. I want him and only him heading the families. I want the peace that Augustus believes he can establish to come about. Shepard tells Graves, well, if that's what you want, then you might want to do something about Javier Vasco. Graves, he then changes the subject. He says, we lost our man in LA, Milo Garrett, who was killed, found dead. Lano did it. Graves, he wants Lano punished for this. Shepard replies, done. Eventually, Graves and Shepard leave the bar. Shepard asks Graves, so what's next for him? Graves answers, the point man, wily times. Shepard wonders why Graves is going to collect him next. Why not the monster or the saint? Graves answers, because the monster is wrestling with demons and the saint, well, the less said about the saint, the better. Relax, Shepard. I've got plans for the point man and plans for you. I need you to train the boy, Loop Hughes. Shepard, he asks, that's two things you need me to tend to. That's two assignments, Graves. You mind if I use one stone? Shepard is going to punish Lano and make him train Loop. Graves answers, I've never had a problem with how you do the math, Shepard. What doesn't add up, though, is why you're so reluctant to finish the job with the girl. Shepard says, I never said I was. All I said was she wanted to go home and that she wasn't ready. Graves jumps in and that you had feelings for her, though they may be deep. I'm not going to go where I shouldn't, Shepard. Shepard to this replies, that's smart, Graves. As for the girl, for my sake, yours, and what's coming, she went where she had to. We see Dizzy waiting at a train stop. She is looking at the mail of her mom's. She sees a final notice bill, and then Dizzy cries as she doesn't know where her mom is. And she may never find her mom, and she just has to move on. 100 Bullets, Issue 38, Cole Burns, Slow Hand. In this one-shot issue, we are going to be jumping between two storylines. One is going to be Cole Burns, and the other is going to be these guys trying to pull a robbery. We begin on the three men that are trying to do the robbery. They are driving to their heist. One of the men is going to stay in the car and act as the getaway driver, and the other two men are going to pull off the actual robbery. Once they arrive at their destination, two of the men get out and put on masks. One is dressed as an ape, and the other has a pig mask on. They head into a bar called the Yankee Tavern. As they are heading into the bar, the man dressed as the ape says, Yo, we play it cool. Don't freak out on me. We walk in and take what we want, and nobody gets hurt. Elsewhere across town, Cold Burns goes to the apartment of his old girlfriend, Sasha. The last time we saw Sasha was way back in issue 10 in the Right Ear Left in the Cold story arc. In that story arc, Cole had an engagement ring that he was potentially mauling over giving to this Sasha. But then when he got woken up as a Minute Man, Cole abandoned her, and he took that ring and stabbed it to a post with a knife. And that is basically how he said bye to Sasha. Cole was waiting for her in her apartment. When Sasha gets home, Cole asks Sasha, Sorry baby, but the candy store was closed. I know you got a sweet tooth, so how about some sugar? Sasha repulsed asks, What are you doing here? Cole replies, Isn't it obvious? Cole tells Sasha to come here, but she replies to him, Get out of here, Cole. 
Cole, he tries to smooth things over. He says, baby, I know I've been gone for a while. Sasha, furious, replies, you've been too gone, you fucking bastard. Cole grabs Sasha from behind and tells her, now is that any way to talk to the man you love? Back across town to the robbery in the Yankee Tavern. The two men pulling off the robbery have begun their work. They have pulled their guns out and taken control of the place. A few civilians are sitting on the floor with their hands on their head. The one employee behind the counter has been smacked in the head with the butt of a gun. The robber with the ape masks asks the employee to open the safe. The employee pleads, Jesus Christ, man, I don't know the combination. Only the owner does and she's on vacation. The robber with the ape mask says, I'm getting pissed off. The employee says, all right, man, the manager, he knows the combination. The robber asks, so when he's showing up, the employee responds, well, he's not. He said he was tired, so he's going to come down in the morning to open the safe and bring the money to the bank. The robber questions, and the owner is okay with that? The employee answers, no way, man, he'd get fired if she knew. The robber to this says, yeah, he should. A guy that manages has got to run the joint the way the boss wants. The employee then starts giving a long answer. He says, well, you think so, but it ain't always true. See, I worked for some rooms and the robber getting annoyed smacks the employee with the gun again. He tells the guy, you get on the phone and get the manager's ass down here. Back over to Cole and Sasha. Sasha, still furious, tells Cole, you've got some balls. Cole, being a smart ass, responds, I seem to remember you liking them. Sasha quips back, you dick. Cole to that says, I remember you being fond of that too. Sasha continues, Jesus, Cole, I haven't seen or heard boo from you in over a year. You think you can just waltz back in here and pick up where we left off? No explanation? No nothing? Not even a goodbye? I worried for months. Why did he leave? What kind of trouble is he in? Did he tire of me? I'd be up at night, wondering if you were alive or dead, wishing that you just walked through the door. Cole tells her, well, now I have. Sasha responds, well, now it's too late. Cole asks, is there someone else? Sasha answers, no. Cole gets down and says, well, that kind of hurts. Sasha answers, good. Cole asks Sasha if she got the ring that he left for her. Sasha answers, what? You want to marry me now? When, Cole? Tomorrow? Cole doesn't answer and he just smokes his cigarette. Sasha continues, well, then why'd you come back? Cole answers, I missed you. Sasha responds, well, I missed you too. Those arms, I used to ache to fall on them. Funny, they don't seem strong enough to hold me anymore. Back over to the robbery. The employee tells the robbers that he phoned the manager and told the manager that he forgot the keys and can't lock up now, so the manager has to get down here. The robber's getting a little impatient. He's asking, well, didn't you tell him to hurry? The employee answers, no, nah, man, you said to act like nothing's wrong. The other robber in the pig masks talks to the ape man robber and says, man, anything else you can do to mess this job up? The ape robber replies, what, it ain't my fault? Come on, the owner of this shithole don't trust his guy. How was I supposed to know? The pig mask robber replies, it's your freaking score, man. If he goes for a piss at 10 to 1 each night, you're supposed to know. I mean, what the hell? Did you even stake this place out properly? Did you just come down here a couple times and drink some cocktails and that's it? Jesus, freaking amateur. As the robber in the pig mask says this, without even thinking, he lifts his mask to drink a beer. And a whole bunch of the hostages in the room see the robber's face. The robber in the pig mask soon realizes what he just did. He tells his partner, Yo, Joe. The ape man robber says, Yo, don't use my name. The robber in the pig mask continues, Yo, they just saw my face. Back over to Cole and Sasha. Sasha opens a little box and gives Cole the engagement ring back. She tells him, you should take this, and remember to hold on to whoever you give it to next. Cole, he feels bad, he still tries to win Sasha over, but she tells him, you left me Cole, I moved on. Cole, he tries to say he's sorry, but Sasha just tells him don't, and to leave, and eventually Cole does. 
back over to the robbery. Ever since the hostages have seen the robber's face, things have really started to escalate. Some of the hostages are pleading, saying, Please, I don't want to die. Another of them says, Man, we'll just tell the cops that we haven't seen you. We'll lie to them, you know? The ape man robber knows this is not going to fly. He tells them cops got bullshit detectors they do. You got to take them out. The robber with the pig mask is upset by this, but he knows it has to be done. They got to kill everyone here. So he starts looking for a knife to stab them all. The ape man robber says, You a fruitcake? You just shoot him. The other robber responds, If I shoot him, then I gotta break down this gun and throw it in the river. No freaking way. The robber in the ape mask replies, Well, Jesus, man, you can't just go stabbing all these people. There's gonna be blood everywhere. The robber in the pig mask responds, If I cap them, there's blood too. What's the difference? The other robber responds, it's a frickin' robbery, not a serial killing. The robber in the pig mask corrects his partner and says, you mean mass murder? There's a difference between serial killing and mass murder. The robber in the ape mask says, use the goddamn gun. As they are both arguing, they hear a knock at the bar room door. They figure it must be the manager. The robber in the ape mask goes and opens the door. And in walks Cole Burns. Cole just happened upon this bar. The robber in the ape mask points his gun at Cole, and although we don't see what happened, Cole took these two robbers down brutally, and all these civilians inside ran out into the street, and the getaway driver, after seeing what happened, he drove off in fear. Cole, he then smokes a cigarette. We see the ape man, his head is twisted backwards and the other robber got stabbed in the chest with a knife. Cole says to the bartender, who's the only man left in the bar, Hey, sorry, it's been one shitty night for me. I just need a drink. You mind if I grab a bottle? Relax, I won't open it till I'm gone, cool? The bartender says, yeah, take it. Cole responds, sweet. Well, peace. Cole then leaves the bar casually. 100 Bullets, Issue 39, Ambitions Audition. It is early in the morning. Augustus Medici, head of the Trust, is with his bodyguard, Crete. Augustus is feeding some crocodiles some meat down by his property in Miami. Crete tells Augustus the car is ready. Augustus answers, wonderful. Before Augustus leaves, he heads inside. He sees Benito is there playing video games. Augustus comments to his boy, You're up early today. Benito responds, Wrong, Daddy. I just got home. Augustus asks Benito, Is that answer meant to get a rise out of me? You know, you remind me of your mother. Benito to this comments, I wouldn't know anything about that. All I remember was how she smelled. Augustus asks, And how is that? Benito answers, Like coffee. Augustus' wife and Benito's mother, we assume, passed away at some point in the past. Augustus is about to head out. Before he does, though, Benito asks, So where are you off to, the bank or the butcher shop? Augustus says no, he's going to Little Havana. Benito, interested, asks if he can tag along. Augustus, surprised, comments, Do you want to go with me? Benito answers, Not really, but I could use some coffee. Elsewhere in Little Havana already, we see Mr. Shepard is there. He gets some coffee and he walks around in the heat. As he is walking around, he notices some suspicious individuals around. Elsewhere, Crete is driving the car with Augustus and Benito in it. Along the way in the car, Augustus is talking to his son. He tells his boy, I've been waiting to offer you something, Benito. Benito, without even hearing what it is, says, No thanks! Augustus continues, I want to offer you responsibility. Benito, unimpressed with his dad, says, stop. Augustus goes on, though. He says, Benito, nothing would make me happier than if you remained a boy forever, my little son. But life has nothing to do with my happiness or yours. You're a born gambler, that I know. And that is a good thing because life is not without risk. But the only way to consistently win is to make certain that whoever you're up against believes, no, knows, 
that they have more to lose than you do. That's not always the case, and you can't force it. But you can pick your time. And it's time you learned to be a man. Benito cuts in and says, You mean to be unhappy? Augustus continues, I mean responsible. You'll never need anything, but I need to know you can take care of yourself. Benito brushes his dad off and slaps Crete on the back of his shoulder and says, That's what the staff's for, right, Crete, my man? Eventually, they arrive at their destination. Benito gets out of the car and tells his dad, I can take care of myself. Elsewhere in Little Havana, Shepard is still eyeing some suspicious individuals. He pulls out his gun and makes it known that he is there. The suspicious individuals eye Shepard, and eventually they decide to leave. Later on, we see Augustus is meeting various men, and they are playing dominoes. This is why Augustus wanted to come to Little Havana, for a social visit, although there is a little bit of a business discussion too. Elsewhere, we see Benito has gone into a little cafe. He starts eyeing a cute blonde woman there. He eventually strikes up a conversation with her. He offers to buy her some ice cream. Back over to Augustus's domino game. Shepard eventually comes over and joins Augustus. Augustus tells his bodyguard Crete, Crete, get Shepard a chair, would you? Augustus then asks Shepard, So, how goes life in the weeds? Shepard answers, Not bad. It beats living in the clouds. Augustus to this responds, I doubt that very much. Now, how's our friend in the shadows? Augustus is referring to Graves. Shepard answers, It's hard to say. Augustus asks again, Hard to say or hard to tell me? Shepard replies, I tell you what I know. I gotta warn you though, you've got a war on your hands. Augustus asks, Shepard, I can count the men against the families on the fingers of one hand. How is that a war? Shepard replies, because the war is not against Graves and the Minutemen, Mr. Medici. The heads of the families may say they're all behind you, but at least one of their hands is holding a knife. You were marked for death today. Five men, maybe more, were about to hit you. Shepard is referring to those suspicious people he saw on the street. Shepard continues, I made them, and they made me, and my reputation saved your life. Augustus comments, You're certain they weren't working for graves? Shepard answers, My reputation and your life would be history if that was the case. They knew you'd be here. They didn't have a clue I would, but they knew who I was. Eventually, Augustus stands up concerned. He says, Oh my God! Shepard tells Augustus, Easy, don't worry, they're gone. Augustus continues, No, Shepard, you don't understand. It's Benito. He's out there. So these people that were potentially going to do a hit on Augustus, they may have moved over to his son, Benito. And we see those suspicious individuals in a car. They are driving by, and they spot Benito on the street. He's eating ice cream with that girl he was hidden on. As Benito and the girl are both licking their ice cream, the hitmen open fire on Benito. They manage to take down the girl, killing her. But before they can kill Benito too, Shepard arrives on the scene, and he opens fire on the men and takes them down instead. Benito, he then starts freaking out. He vomits from all the blood and gore around him. Shepard is still shooting people, trying to save Benito. Eventually, Augustus pulls up in the car with Crete driving. The car stops and Augustus yells to his son, Benito, get in the car! Shepard tells Benito, do what your father says. Benito gets in the car with his dad and it drives off. In the car, Augustus asks, are you alright? Benito answers, Yeah, I'm fine. Sorry about your dominoes game. Augustus answers, What? Oh no, don't worry about that. Benito then says, Hey dad, maybe when we get home you can teach me how to play. 100 Bullets Issue 40 Night of the Payday Shepard meets with the Minuteman, Lano. Shepard has a job for Lano. 
for $500,000. There's a guy in North Carolina they need taken out. Lotto has to either make the guy disappear, or if the body is going to be found, it has to seem like a random violence, a tragedy. Lano takes the job and decides to go with the more violent public route. He brutally beats the man with a baseball bat, successfully killing him. A week later, after a successful job well done, Lano goes to Pittsburgh to meet with Shepard again to collect his payment. Shepard and Lano meet on a bridge there in Pittsburgh. Shepard pays Lano the 500000 but he pays Lano with $1,000 bills, which I did not even know existed. I actually looked it up, and $1,000 bills were last printed in 1945, and they were officially discontinued in 1969. They are still legal tender, though. When Lano sees the stack of $1,000 bills, he asks Shepard, What the fuck? Shepard tells Lano, It's all there. Lano questions in $1,000 bills? That's tall paper. Shepard replies, You're a big man, living large. Not a problem. Lano eventually just brushes it off, saying, Nah, no sweat off my balls. Eventually, Shepard and Lano talk more seriously. Shepard tells Lano, You pissed some people off. Lano replies, Not a day goes by I don't. Shepard continues, Dangerous people. Lano to this says, Not more than me. And you tell him that. And you tell me. Why are you telling me this? Shepard warns Lano. There's a war in the wind, Lano. And you may want to stay out of the crossfire. Lano to this comments. That's a threat to keep me from siding with Graves. Save your breath. Graves tried to kill me. And if I ever see him again, he's going to wish he succeeded. Shepard responds. Lano, if Graves wanted you dead we wouldn't be having this conversation. Anyway, we have other plans for you. Lano asks, we have plans? Which side are you on, Shepard? Shepard answers, what are my choices, Lano? Lano asks, you still work for the trust? Shepard answers, I do. Lano continues, well then you don't have a choice. Shepard responds, assuming the trust is one-sided. Lano to this says, against Graves? It damn well will be. Count on it. Shepard, you gave me some good advice back when I was listening, so hear what I'm saying now. You call it a war, but to Graves, it's a game. And that gives him the edge. You can't win. And I mean you personally, Shepard. However things shake out, you'll lose if you don't die first. Shepard responds, That may be, Lano, but there's a lot of maybes I'm dealing with. Like... Maybe sooner or later, you're going to have to pick a side. Maybe. Or maybe a side will pick you. After that ominous conversation, Lano goes back to the hotel he is staying at in town. He gives the desk clerk there one of his new thousand dollar bills. He tells the old lady he's going to be staying here a couple of nights. The hotel employee says, I can't break this. Lano to this replies, oh, I guess not. Seeing it ain't a mirror. Just give me the change tomorrow. And if you don't, you and me are going to dirty up some clean sheets. How's that sound? Lano then goes up to his hotel room. The girl, Echo Memoria, is there. She was the femme fatale we met in Volume 5, the counterfeit detective. Echo is not impressed with this dirty hotel they are staying in. She complains that she's bored and it smells in here, and there are stains. Lano tells her, it's called atmosphere. Lano throws Echo his stack of a thousand dollar bills and tells her, why don't you peel yourself off a few and treat yourself? Echo asks to what? Lano answers, a dress, some jewelry, I could give a shit. Later on in the bar in the downstairs hotel lobby, Lano was reading the newspaper. The headline on the newspaper reads, Downtown Bank Robbed. Lano doesn't know it yet, but those thousand dollar bills that Shepard gave him, they are connected to that bank robbery. Shepard was framing Lano. Lano does not know this yet though, so he is still enjoying himself. He's drinking. He gives the bartender there a thousand dollar tip. 
sliding the bill over to him. While Alana was drinking, some FBI agents come into the hotel. They seem to have gotten tipped off about the thousand dollar bills and how they are connected to the bank robbery. They talk to the desk clerk about the money and she tells them about Lano staying in the hotel. Lano manages to avoid things for a bit, but eventually things get escalated. Lano grabs the desk clerk, the old woman, and he puts a gun to her head. And then some normal Pittsburgh cops manage to find Lano. They point their guns on him and tell him to freeze and to drop his weapon and do it now. Lano answers, you ain't the boss of me. Lano brutally beats some of the cops up inside. He tries to exit to the hotel, but then the FBI agents that are there confront him. A gun battle ensues. Lano eventually heads outside of the hotel, only to be confronted by even more cops waiting out there. The cops have already arrested Echo Memoria. She is sitting in the back of their car. Lano, not one to back down, points his guns at the cops, and the cops open fire and take Lano down. 100 Bullets, Issue 41, A Crash Agent Graves is having a meeting with three heads of the families of the Trust. There is Fulvio Carlito of the Carlito family, Helena Coitias of the Coitias family, and Javier Vasco of the Vasco family. They are all atop a high tower. Graves is looking down at the city below and he comments, Tiny lives, all those lights in the windows. Look through the glass and all you see is tiny lives. You said that to me once, Javier. About faces in those windows and eyes in those faces. When they look out at the lights, lights like in here, what do they see? Down in the city below. In one of those windows, we see one of those tiny lives with faces and eyes. A man is looking out the window in his home. His girlfriend asks him, what are you doing, baby? The man answers, thinking. The woman, she is watching TV. They are announcing the winning lottery tickets for the night. Unfortunately, her and her boyfriend did not win. The two of them share some drinks, but then the man sees something out the window. He sees a car drive over a ravine. He tells his girlfriend to call the cops. He's going to run and see if they're okay. Back over to Agent Graves. He sits down at a table for his meeting with the heads of the Carlito, Coitius, and Vasco family. He asks them, Now, what's this all about? Vasco tells Graves, First, we'd like you to know, Graves, the trust's decision to terminate the Minutemen. It wasn't personal. Graves replies, it was to me. Helena Cotius says, well, we want to make it up to you. Graves comments, well, that would take some doing. Graves questions what they have in mind. Vasco replies, simple, we want to give you what you want most. We jump back over to the man with his girlfriend. They have ran over to the car that drove into the ravine. The driver is dead. The man and the woman notice that the driver has something in his hand, a little piece of paper. The woman picks the paper out of the man's hand and she looks at it. And she exclaims, Oh my God! We jump back to the meeting with Graves. Graves tells the people here, You're in no position to give me what I want. You are only three. There are 13 members in the trust. Helena Coitius explains, 12. The trust has decided to absorb Daniel's house amongst the remaining families rather than pass it to his heirs. Back over to the man and the woman near the ravine. The woman explains that the man in the car crash was holding the winning lottery ticket. They announced the numbers on the radio. The guy must have been checking it as he was driving and he so excited he won he drove off the road. The man asks, are you positive? The woman answers, yeah, it's the numbers, baby. He won the frickin' lottery! The man grabs the lottery ticket out of his girlfriend's hand and says, You mean, we won the lottery! Back over to Graves. Javier Vasco reveals that he did object to carving up Daniel's territory. 
but not to the elimination of a family. Graves, when he learns this information, says, The Minutemen would not have allowed this. Checks and balances. If one family moves against another, the Minutemen move against them. Every pound of flesh is answered for. Helena replies, The status quo. But Augustus persuaded us the grass could be greener without you. Graves asks, And? Javier Vasco continues, And? We think the trust needs some yard work. We jump back over to the man and his girlfriend. The girlfriend comments to her boyfriend, I can't do it. It's stealing. It's wrong. She does not want to keep the lottery ticket. The boyfriend argues, what? Wrong? What's a lottery ticket worth to a corpse? The girlfriend questions, well, what if it was you? What about his wife? The man argues, eh, we don't even know if this guy had a wife. He then goes over to the man's body and rifles through his pockets. He finds the man's wallet. He opens it. He looks inside. He was trying to prove that this guy was a loser worth stealing from. But then he finds pictures of the man's family and his nine kids. Well, the man here is starting to have second thoughts. He says, eh, maybe we should give her the money. And maybe she'll give us a reward or something. The woman comments, but what about our kids? The boyfriend replies, well, last time I checked, they were swimming around the tip of a rubber, like they always do before I flush them. The woman responds, well, we're going to have some someday, though, right? The man thinks on it and says, yeah, but you said it yourself. This is wrong. I mean, look at the picture of these kids. It's really wrong. The girlfriend comes around and says, yeah, you're right. But they still keep thinking it through. The man says, I mean, unless... Back over to Graves' meeting. Helena comments that 12 families is a bad number. It's even. There's no deciding vote. Graves responds, I see. And you're not interested in restoring the house of Perez, so one more family has to go. The Simone family is weak. Javier and Fulvio say, The house of Medici is strong. Too strong. Graves begins putting his jacket back on. He says, I'm not interested in having Augustus's blood on my hands. The others explain they're not asking for Graves to kill Augustus. In fact, they want Graves' hands clean. But after the dust settles and Augustus is buried, they want to reinstate the Minuteman, or what's left of them. They want to give Graves his job back. Isn't that what is most important to him? Back over to the man and the woman with the winning lottery ticket. The man begins to argue that, you know, maybe they'll keep the winning lottery money, but they'll give the grieving widow a million dollars or something. The woman responds, you want to give them a million dollars? The man responds, I mean, we give them whatever amount you think you're happy with. We really set them up, you know? I mean, the lottery's a lot of money. Plenty to go around for everybody, ain't it? Bottom line, we're all in this together. Back over to Graves and his meeting. He tells the three families here, This intrigues me. Now consider it. We jump back to the man and woman with the winning lottery ticket. They spent so long arguing that the police finally arrived. And what do the police do? Well, they arrest the man and the woman, and they take that winning lottery ticket for themselves. The dirty cop that took it and realized what it was smiles as he places it in his pocket. Back up to Graves and the three members of the trust looking down at the city below. Javier Vasco tells Graves, Tiny lives, listen closely, you can hear them, gasping for breath. They share the same air but nothing else. Big hopes, bigger disappointments, just tiny lives. Do you see them, Graves? Graves answers, Yes, Javier, I do. 100 Bullets, Issue 42, Point Off the Edge. In this issue, we will be checking back in on the laziest minute man, Wiley Times. The last time we saw Wiley was back in El Paso, Texas in the Contra Bandolero story arc, which ended in issue 30. In that issue, Shepard and Dizzy were trying to wake Wiley up 
and make him remember his Minuteman past. But they did not know the key word, Croatoa. So we check back in on Wiley now. Wiley is still staying in his rundown apartment motel. Wiley's landlord, Norm, knocks on the door. Norm asks for his rent money. He tells Wiley he's three weeks behind. Norm asks, what do you gotta say for yourself? Wiley answers, me? How did you let this happen? Norm getting angry says, don't get bright with me, dim bulb. You got till Friday. And if you don't pay, I'm gonna have my brother, your boss, garnish your wages down at the gas station. Once Norm leaves, Wiley goes back and lies on his bed and thinks about how annoying his life is right now. And that is when Agent Graves knocks on Wiley's door. When Wiley opens the door, Graves says, Wiley times, I have something for you. Wiley asks, is it one of those giant checks? Graves answers, no, but it's a golden opportunity. Graves gives Wiley one of his famous attache briefcases. Wiley doesn't seem to really care, but when Graves asks if he's gonna open it, Wiley says, All right, Santa, let's have a peek. When he opens the briefcase and sees the bullets and gun inside, Wiley comments, What the hell kind of sick contest did I win? Graves tells Wiley, You got a golden opportunity. You have a miserable life, Wiley. One lacking direction. I'm giving you the chance to point that gun at the man responsible. Graves then goes into his whole explanation of how if Wiley uses his gun to kill the target, he'll have carte blanche immunity. Wiley doesn't seem to really care though. He says, eh, my life's not as bad as you think. Graves asks, it's that? Wiley continues, well, maybe, but I'm not gonna kill anybody because of it. Graves explains, I never said you had to. In that file is a picture of the man who ruined your life and proof that what I've said is true. Wiley asks, is it my landlord, Norm? Graves answers, no. Wiley asks, is it his squirt of a brother? Graves answers, no. Wiley then says, well then, whoever it is, I got no beef with. So you go find some other sap to buy what you're selling, or better yet, why don't you pop this problem guy yourself? Wiley then heads down to the gas station where he works. And there, his boss, Arn, talks to him. Arn makes a sarcastic comment. He's trying to fix something, and then he tells Wiley, Hey Wiley, this distributor cap's just like you. It don't work. Wiley replies, Wow, cruel yet clever at the same time. That's a real talent you have. As the two of them are talking, a man comes in with a woman. The woman has a black eye, most likely from the guy she's with punching her in the face. The man asks if his girlfriend here can use the bathroom. The owner, Arn, says she can. The key to it is over there. So the woman goes into the washroom while her man waits outside. Meanwhile, Wiley and his boss, Arn, continue talking. Arn says to Wiley, Look, I offered to teach you in the garage how to work on cars. Wiley, who's very lazy, replies, Whoa, Arn, slow down. I'm still trying to master the gas pump inside of the business. Arn says, Most everybody these days uses self-serve. Wiley to this says, right, so I don't get much time to practice. Sides, you want to show me the ropes under the hood? After I'm off the clock, that's free labor. Slightly less than the piddly pesos you're already paying me. The customer with the girlfriend in the washroom overhears this conversation. He gets curious. He asks Wiley, how much you make? Wiley answers, six bucks an hour. The customer does some math and says, all right, that's about um, 240 a week. And that's so low, that's a crime is what it is. Wiley to this responds, exactly pal, and you know what they say about crime, it doesn't pay. The owner, Arn, defending himself says, hey, what I pay my man is an honest wage. The customer responds, honestly, it sucks shit. While they continue arguing, the customer's girlfriend comes back into the store. She apologizes, she says, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry, but the bathroom is overflowing. The girl's boyfriend chimes in, Frickin' women, eh? Always use too much goddamn toilet paper, you know? Arn tells Wiley, Wiley, grab a mop and step to it. Wiley reluctantly grabs that mop and heads over to the ladies' washroom. Inside, he finds, with lipstick written on the mirror, he's going to kill me. Wiley heads back inside the gas station. The customer and the owner are continuing to argue about 
the amount of Wiley's pay and if it is a fair amount or not. Wiley asks the customer, do you need some gas? I can pump it for you. The man says, sure. Wiley goes to fill the man's car up, but then he unscrews the tire so the air comes out. He's doing this to potentially save the man's girlfriend that is fearing for her life. As Wiley heads back into the gas station, the customer ends up shooting at Arn, the owner. Their argument got heated, and the customer pissed off shot him. Wiley comments, Jesus Christ! The customer explains, he pissed me off. Wiley responds, so? He pisses me off a hundred times a day. The customer responds, yeah, and you never do nothing about it. And look where you are. If you let a man get away with screwing you over once, you stay bent over so he can screw you over again and again whenever he damn well pleases. The customer holding his gun decides to go over to the register and take some cash out of it for himself. The customer I and Wiley says, You been on the inside, boy? I can see it in your eyes. You know what I'm speaking of. The customer then walks over to Wiley and punches him in the gut. The customer then sniffs Wiley's breath and he can tell that Wiley's been drinking recently. The customer, he then puts his gun to Wiley's head and is going to kill him too. But then all of a sudden, the man's girlfriend grabs a hot coffee pot and she smashes it over her boyfriend's head. The man falls down to the ground and he screams, shit, you crazy bitch. The girlfriend then picks up the gun and shoots her boyfriend dead. Afterwards, the girl is crying about what she just did. Wiley's boss, Arden, who is still alive but severely injured, he comments, I'm dying, Wiley, I'm dying. Wiley replies, eh, you might be okay. Arn asks, how about that son of a bitch who killed me? Wiley, looking at the dead customer, says, eh, he's not okay. Arn replies, good work. You know, about that raise I promised you. Wiley to this says, it's a little late to try and make heaven on my prayers, Arn. Arn confused says, What? You mean I'm not gonna be okay? You lied to me? Wiley to this says, No, I quit. Wiley grabs some of the cash from the register and leaves with it. And as he is leaving, Agent Graves is waiting outside. Graves asks if Wiley wants a ride in his car. Wiley, not having many options, says yes. Graves tells Wiley, Wiley, all I want is for you to understand why you are who you are, and who's responsible. In the back of the car, Wiley opens that attaché briefcase again, and inside, he looks at the photograph of the man that is supposedly responsible for ruining his life. Graves tells Wiley, his name is Shepard. And with this cliffhanger, we end Volume 6. All right, so that was volume six. Let me go through my thoughts on the various issues in this volume. So first was on accidental purpose. That is the dizzy focused issue. And uh, that was pretty interesting. We have Graves and Shepard talking and we learn a little bit about their discussions on the trust and the Minuteman and how they feel about it. And they're coming together to make some deals. So that was fun. And then Dizzy goes back home to see her old friends and family. And she realizes you can't go home again. Home is not always still there for you, and it's not always how you remembered it to be. So, that was pretty good stuff. Next issue, Cole Burns' Slow Hand. That is the Cole-focused issue, where Cole goes back to see his girlfriend that he abandoned, and she wants nothing to do with him. So, kind of nice to see that plot line picked up again. And then we had that robbery at a, at a, uh, at a bar. And uh, that was pretty exciting, too. These robbers trying to get money, and they're failing. And then Cole comes in in the end and takes them down. So, pretty fun stuff. Although, why was Cole going to the bar? That seems like quite the happenstance that he just happened to cross that bar at the time. Next issue was Ambition's Audition. That is the Benito Medici storyline. That was really good stuff where Augustus and uh, Benito go to Little Havana, and there's a hit on Augustus as well as Benito, and it gets thwarted, but uh, pretty exciting stuff in that one. Then we had Night of the Payday, the Lano-centric one, which was also very exciting. Uh, Lano and Shepard having some important discussions. 
Shepard betrays Lano, gives him these thousand dollar bills, and uh, Lano gets arrested by the police and goes down in a hail of gunfire. Very exciting. The next issue, a crash. That was the Graves-centric issue, where Graves is having a meeting with three members of the Trust, and they are coming to a secret agreement. So that was really good stuff. And then on top of that, I really liked the whole Tiny Lives aspect of that storyline, where the Trust and Graves are looking down at the city and kind of mocking the tiny lives of the normal, average people. And we follow one such story of a tiny life with this man and woman, and they find this guy that crashed who happened to win the lottery, and they're debating, should they keep the ticket? And then eventually they wait too long, and the cops come and arrest them and take the lottery ticket from them. So all in all, I thought that was a very fantastic issue. And the last issue in this volume was Point Off the Edge, the Wily Times story arc. And that was fun as well, where Graves gives Wiley the attache, and Wiley, you know, he's just going to work. I love how Wiley was kind of like, not even interested in the attache, and he's just like, whatever. And I love how lazy Wiley was, uh, too, at his job. So we have some uh, fun interactions between Wiley and his boss in the gas station. And then things ramp up in excitement when a customer comes in and uh, shoots Wiley's boss, and there's a big uh, uh, confrontation there. So that was solid stuff. And then we end on a pretty solid cliffhanger, too, where Wiley goes off with Graves, and Graves tells Wiley that Shepard ruined his life. Very interesting thread to pick up in the next few volumes. So yeah, I really liked all of these storylines in here. I think they were there were no clunkers, they were all solid. So this was a great volume. I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next week with the next volume.